my dudes, my name is Tiffany. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss things relevant to social issues and media. Originally, the focus of this video was just gonna be flex culture. But we're already well aware of that. So as I was writing this, I decided to focus it on the dark sides of flex culture. I know, very dramatic title, provocative, you gotta get those views. <laughs> but really, I am gonna be discussing the dark sides. As always, I will give some background information and then we will get into the deeper issues. So let's start with, what is flexing? Generally, flexing equals showing off. So this video is mostly gonna focus on showing off material possessions and wealth, but we can all flex in a number of ways. You may flex the colleges you got into, the people you're friends with, how much you travel, generally how smart, rich, successful, and happy you are. You may literally flex your muscular physique. Before social media, the majority of flexing came from traditional celebrities in shows such as MTV Cribs, or we would see stars on the red carpets showing off their designer outfits. But hip hop and rap have been hugely influential in flex culture, and I would argue that it's very likely the term flex was invented in hip hop. I did try to figure this out, but I couldn't find the exact origins. However, I did find that Ice Cube, for one, was a fan of this phrase back in like the early 90s. If you happen to know about the etymology of flex in this context, let me know. Especially recently though, this term has become even more popularized. Rapper Meek Mill has a song titled Flexing in which he says, spent a hundred racks on my chain. All them know my name. I be flexin'. Flexin'. The dorky aunt energy is in full swing right now. These days, flexing is all over social media, naturally. I think it is pretty hard to resist flexing, showing off, when you have something to show off. And ultimately, most flexing is based on money. So in our society, <laughs> capitalism, neoliberalism especially, we generally believe that money equals success and we want people to perceive us as successful. So flexing comes in the form of this extreme consumerism and materialism. Urban Dictionary really came through for me on this video. Their definition of flex is showing off your valuables in a non-humble way. So we've seen this all over YouTube. We have examples such as Jeffree Star, Jake Paul, Rice Gum, Gabby DiMartino, The Ace Family, and then that billionaire son, Bobby, flexing on us because he was born into a rich family. These creators are some of the most well-known for specifically making being rich a central part of their brand. So a lot of their content involves their material goods or their wealth. And to me, this seems very, how do I say, new money? You know that phrase or saying where basically like wealthy people, like real wealthy people will look average and like new rich or fake rich people are the ones who are so blatant about trying to look rich. Interesting. Not to say that I agree with that concept of like judging people based on how they express their wealth, even though that's kind of what this whole video is. To me, that seems to imply that there's like a right way to be rich and a wrong way. And you should like learn the rules of how to present yourself as a rich or wealthy person. And that just seems way too classist for me to agree with. But I just read an article comparing old money, like Kate Middleton, British royal family, to new money, Pippa Middleton and her millionaire husband. And I was just like, why am I reading this? But obviously, unless a specific influencer came from a wealthy family, like billionaire's son, most creators are experiencing new money. YouTube money is definitely new money. Social media money is new money. This also reflects why hip hop artists and rappers tend to flex their wealth because a lot of them come from rough backgrounds or poverty or at least try to pretend like they did. Their jewelry and cars are very outward symbols of their success and new wealth and higher social status. Anyway, a lot of flex culture is kind of about the excessiveness of it all. You know, you don't just have one luxury car, you have five. And speaking of excessive spending, I still do wanna make a video about what I call money spending content, which is relevant to this video, but a little bit different. I'm gonna focus on David Dobrik, Mr. Beast, that type of content, so. Stay tuned. Anyway, as an example of excessive spending, I will reference a photo I came across on Instagram. It was Alyssa Violet surrounded by eight Louis Vuitton bags. And it was so casual. Her caption was like, long day, 
My favorite part of that picture, aside from the opulence, is the fact that she intentionally like took out all of the bags and boxes and stacked them to fill up as much of the frame as possible. Because I guess luxury brands love to like put the bag in a box and put that in a bigger box and put that in a bag and then put one more bag in it like that SpongeBob chocolate episode. That is luxury to me. Obviously I've never been as rich as Alyssa Violet or rich at all for that matter, but I would think that shopping like that would actually make it seem like a less fun and meaningful experience. Like, I feel like shopping is fun because of the anticipation. You get really excited about something, you finally get to go buy it. And I feel like buying one Louis Vuitton bag and really getting to appreciate it would be better than buying eight. I mean, I was just gonna say, it's like having eight children, you can't love them all. Now let's get into my opinion on designer items because clearly I wanna talk about it. I've never personally been a fan of like designer or luxury brands. It's never been something that has tempted or captivated me. I would love to spend a lot of money on, you know, pricier ethical or sustainable brands because that's something that is meaningful to me. So if I ever have the chance, if you see me flexing in like reformation, okay. But you probably would never catch me wearing a jumpsuit covered in logos. It's just, it's not my thing. I find it to be ugly and tacky, okay? And I say that as someone who is a big fan of ugly and tacky things, but I feel like I like it for the irony of it all. I don't think you can ironically buy an ugly and tacky item as a joke if it costs you like $10,000. It's not the same. I also think that it's kind of almost lazy to just constantly be decked out in like blatantly designer items. Like you're not able to develop your own actual sense of style because you're just gonna end up buying anything that any designer puts out because if they put it out, then it's automatically assumed to be like stylish and impressive, therefore making it a kind of safe choice. And if people make fun of you, then you can flex on them for the fact that you can spend so much money on something so ugly and tacky. It's win-win, right? Anyway, that's my hot take. Sorry if I offended anybody. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Actually, I don't. If you're offended that I think Louis Vuitton and Gucci are ugly, don't be. I'm sure you think I... <laughs> you might think my sweater is ugly or my... By the way, this bedspread, everybody asks if it's whales or what. It's just paisley patterns. You might think my paisley bedspread is ugly. Fair enough. Moving on, here's a clip from a video that I really enjoyed. It is called The Normalization of Luxury Fashion, and it was posted by a channel called Smoky Glow. And I'm looking at the actual pure design of the bag without the label attached to it, without the Gucci, knowing that it's a fake, knowing that it's not authentic. And I'm like, I don't even really like this. <laughs> you don't have the Louis Vuitton thing on you, so I don't like how you look, but they're the same bag. One's just missing a label. And it got me thinking even more deeply about how much value we put into designer things. By the way, this video is a collab with Hannah, Smoky Glow. She is doing her glow mist right now, so she's been posting every day. Hannah's channel is great. It's all about makeup and commentary, and I really, really love her perspectives on things. So after this video, make sure you go to her channel to hear her thoughts about flex culture. Enough with the hands, let's continue. Why do I have so much beef with luxury brands? One thing is that they are all over YouTube these days, and this is a relatively new phenomenon. This has only really developed and become more of a thing in the past few years, but like we have debatably relatable Emma Chamberlain working with Louis Vuitton constantly. We have a lot of top YouTubers constantly talking about or shopping at Gucci as kind of a joke, but then it's like, and it's not really a joke, kind of serious. <laughs> and they're still promoting it as a sought after kind of brand because buying Gucci is a status symbol. So finally, let's get into the actual dark sides, Tiffany. The first being that luxury brands are exploitative. Despite their ridiculously high price tags, most luxury brands still exploit their workers in terms of low wages and dangerous working conditions, to name a few, which I find just absolutely disgraceful. Unfortunately, these things are true of most brands because most brands want to produce their products at the lowest possible price, but especially brands this expensive, they, of all companies, should be able to produce their products in a more ethical way and actually pay their workers living wages. So as I said, if I were rich, I would be throwing down cash on very ethical and sustainable brands. I would live for that. Ugh. 
someday. I've said it before, but I hate seeing really obnoxiously rich people who flex their wealth, also still supporting ultra cheap fast fashion clothing. It just grinds my gears. I really do think that wealthier people have a social obligation and a responsibility to use their money for good. Ultimately, everyone has the choice to spend the money the way that they wish to, but that won't stop me from judging you if you have way more money and accessibility than the average person, but still choose choose to support deeply deeply unethical brands I'm getting heated but it's not just that another issue is also overconsumption in general I really do find it wasteful especially when we're talking about these extreme quantities that are often displayed in flex culture we have people with extra rooms as closets we have massive bag and shoe collections it's just the sheer amount of items that a single person can own even if you were buying as ethically and sustainably as possible and I know this is when somebody comes in and says there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. I know, but if you do your best, I still wouldn't want you to overconsume the most ethical and sustainable things because of course, naturally part of being more sustainable is not overconsuming. Let's touch on the environmental impact of flex culture. So naturally we're talking about waste, baby. <laughs> I gotta stop throwing baby onto everything, it doesn't work. So again, in terms of clothing, the environmental impact is that it creates a lot more waste and there's more resource usage. The thing is with these people who are flexing, it's not just about not repeating outfits in public, but these people have closets full of clothing, brand new things, tags still on them that they will never wear. And I just find that unbelievable. How do you not wear something and cut the tag off as soon as you get home? That's what I do when I buy something new. And then typically they have a huge mansion, which is wasteful because of all the energy and power, heating and cooling that it takes to manage a large home. And then of course you have to buy more and more things to be able to furnish and decorate your mansion. Another thing that gets me heated is the glorification of flying in a private plane. We've seen a lot more influencers flying private. And okay, I'm not a celebrity. I'm not known by millions of people. Maybe there is some sort of a safety element and if you can afford to fly private, I guess some people make that choice because they can't fly commercial, they would be mobbed. Can you imagine Kim and Kanye on a United flight? No. I thought that was an impossible scenario and then I Googled it and they literally recently flew commercial on a United flight. I guess I should keep up with the Kardashians, am I right? But I would assume a large part of it is also for the flex. I mean, we can see that in their photos that they take. They don't quietly fly private. You don't fly private and not take photos of it. Come on. And also in terms of influencers, even if you are Jeffree Star, I don't think you're that famous to where you can't fly first class on a commercial flight. Like, yeah, you might get a large number of people recognizing you, but just they have to keep walking to the back of the plane, you know, it's fine. Even if you can afford to fly private, I do not think it is justified in terms of the environmental impact. The thing is flying is one of the most large, the biggest, impacts on an individual's carbon footprint. So like for me, my carbon footprint would be rather low, but because I fly pretty often, I've got family all over the place, it goes up. But at least commercial flights are efficient in cramming as many people as possible into coach. I'm gonna see if I can find an infographic to show the difference between flying private and flying commercial. It's just purely wasteful, okay? Just please, rich influencers, just fly first class. I know it's not that much of a flex, but also you'll be flexing on the 99% of people who will never ever fly first class in their life, let alone the millions of people who never fly in their lifetime at all. Anyway, the next segment of this video, another dark side of flex culture is that all of these elements are terrible influences for children. Many of these creators have young audiences such as Jake Paul and Rice Gum. Imagine flexing on kids, you know? Imagine knowing that your average viewer is a 10 year old and still like flexing on them. 
I don't know. But also family vloggers are guilty of this. And I try to avoid family vloggers. I feel some type of way about them generally. I made two videos about family vloggers last year, if you wanna watch them, and I'm overdue. I'm gonna make another video about them soon because it just makes me angry. Here's an example. I found a family who makes videos like this often. I'll buy everything at the Apple store that starts with the letters in your name. It's our life challenge. So this daughter, whose name starts with E, came out and bought Beats, trying to say that they count because they're called over-ear headphones. I don't think she's following the rules, but then her mom makes it very uncomfortable anyway. Over-ear, it's the generic title for it. That is not a challenge. That's just shopping for content. So I don't know how the new family content monetization rules have affected their revenue, but at least prior to this, family channels have been making bank, okay? And I've noticed that once you get popular enough and make so much money that your content reverts to just spending money content. This is typical of a lot of channels. It's a fascinating phenomenon. But I find it really ironic because if you were to tell somebody who didn't know much about YouTube or family vloggers, if you were to ask them what they think these channels would be about, it's definitely not the wholesome, educational, family-oriented content that they would probably expect. Content like this ultimately just promotes unlimited spending and excessive hauls this is not giving the children who watch their videos a reasonable or realistic expectation of what life is or what their own parents can or should provide for them. I hate this. I hate it so much. You're a role model to millions of children and you're making this content. It, oh, it gets the views though, so you don't need to care about morality. I also found a channel of a 12-year-old girl named Jessalyn Grace who has over a million subscribers, and she is just constantly flexing on us, for real. Maybe not in her personality, but in her massive hauls. I was shocked to see the number of very extravagant, even luxury hauls on this 12-year-old girl's channel. She's 12. Like, clearly she's made a lot of money from this, her family has made a lot of money from this, but like, her audience is probably mostly children. And I'm used to rampant materialism in adults or even teenagers, but for like actual children, kids may be obsessed with wanting to buy all the toys that exist, but they shouldn't be watching videos that encourage them to want luxury items, luxury tech, luxury clothing. I am so angry. Children want Gucci now. I recently found this video of some young, young girls. They looked like they were like eight years old doing this little Gucci haul. I assume it was fake Gucci, obviously. And I feel like it was in reference to Jake Paul or somebody, maybe I can find it. I feel like an eight-year-old shouldn't even know what Gucci is. That has no place in their life. They should be excited about buying a new shirt from Target or maybe Justice if you're really bougie. But the glorification of luxury goods is not just a problem for children, though I am very disturbed that this is becoming a trend. A lot of people kind of grow up consuming, you know, culture and content and have this growing desire to wanna buy luxury goods. So then by the time they can shop for themselves, maybe that's what they wanna buy. Back in my day, back when it was like early beauty guru day, I feel like all the girls just wanted like a Michael Kors watch, which I don't know how much it cost, I didn't have one. Maybe a few hundred dollars? That's one thing, that's a pricey item. That's an expensive thing for a teenager or even a young adult to want, right? Or maybe they dreamed of like one day being able to save up and buy one designer bag. But the content that is being created today is like a million miles past that. My question is, are luxury items worth it? Clearly you've already heard my opinion, I wouldn't want it, but are they worth it for other people who do place value in them? Watch any worst purchases of my 20s video and you will find a person regretting buying a designer bag or buying a designer pair of shoes that they previously thought they needed and it would change their life and make their life so much better and then they buy it and they either never use it, maybe it's not their style, or maybe because it's so expensive they feel like they can't even take it out of the house. So then they just hold on to it and it sits in their closet. In a lot of situations, it seems like, again, the anticipation is the fun part. As soon as you buy something, that magic is gone. Obviously, in the case of these influencers who are telling their stories, I'm sure they're fine. Clearly, they could afford it at the time. If they wanted to today, they could resell it, I'm sure. But the problem is a lot of people go into debt 
to try to buy these items. And those are the people who cannot afford to be doing that. Unrealistic expectations. A lot of influencers believe that they must create and maintain this image of luxury in order to be interesting. There's a huge pressure to buy new clothes all the time, especially if you're a fashion creator, to never ever repeat outfits on Instagram. There's a pressure to post really extravagant, expensive hauls. By the way, as many people know, if influencers are buying these things for videos, they may be able to write these off as business expenses so they are getting some kind of tax benefit out of it. It's kind of a gray area and I'm obviously not a tax professional so don't take my advice, I'm not giving you advice. But just for the average person, I hope that you know that this is not normal, it's not meant to be normal, and even among influencers it's a very troubling and toxic need to feel like you constantly have to shop. It is not necessary for anyone, whether you're an influencer or not, to have new clothes in every Instagram picture. That is not the only way to be stylish. I encourage you to try to be a little bit more creative with what you already have. Mix things up, do a little DIY or something. Best Dress talks about this a lot. Also, Carrie Dayton and Sarah Hawkinson, I've heard talk about the importance of like reinvigorating your wardrobe and reminding yourself you don't always have to buy something new, you just have to wear something in a new way. So another part of flex culture is that all of these elements sometimes encourage people to create this image to flex, even if it is not real. So back to Urban Dictionary, a secondary definition of flex is to put up a fake front. And I found that so interesting, these two definitions and especially in context of social media. It's like, are you flexing? Or are you like flexing, you know? To me, flex culture is very empty, but being deceptive, lying, or fake flexing is even more painfully empty. Social media is an illusion. People can always create the image that they want to portray online. For example, many regular people, non-influencer people, often do this little trick where they will buy an outfit, they'll keep the tags on, they'll take some pics in it, and then they will return it. That's kind of a normal thing. I don't know if people do that necessarily to flex on social media, but it is kind of a life hack to be able to wear something new without actually buying it. But fake flexes go even further than this, especially in the influencer world. I have a few examples. How can you create the illusion of a full wardrobe? As I mentioned, some people will intentionally buy the cheapest possible trendy clothing, AKA those terrible Chinese fashion websites specifically. They will buy dirt cheap clothing, even though it looks or feels terrible in person, as long as it looks good in pictures, because that's all that matters. Obviously, buying really cheap clothing is the way to buy more clothing and never have to repeat your outfit. You could literally throw that shirt away because it means nothing to you, because it is such low quality, because it was produced in such terrible conditions and the company doesn't care about the materials or the workers. You can also create the illusion of a perfect appearance. Obviously, we are all aware of Facetune. I have also made a video about Facetune if you wanna check that out. People on social media, can and do change their faces and bodies. We know this, but it is still so shocking to me. There are many Instagrammers with massive followings who constantly get comments about how their goals, their life is goals, their body is goals, when that is not their real face, that is not their real body, that is not their real life. But because those creators do succeed in creating the illusion, the image of a dream life, they will still get sponsorships, they will still get paid and that blows my mind. There's also definitely an idea that you can kind of buy your way into being an influencer. So obviously people assume that to be an influencer, you need to have clothes. Well, you need to have clothes if you don't wanna get demonetized or deleted. You need to have good new clothes. So you gotta go shopping. You should probably travel so that you can take photos in really beautiful places. There was actually a girl who went $10,000 in debt for Instagram, trying to become an influencer. I remember any time I would post travel content, it performed the best. So I spent a lot of money going to places. One of the first big ticket items I bought was a Louis Vuitton bag. It was something I wanted to post immediately. So next time you see somebody who looks like they have a really luxurious life on Instagram, you never know. They may be deeply in debt trying to achieve that image. Another thing, some influencers pay to rent these dream apartment studio spaces 
in order to produce content in them. So maybe they don't ever say explicitly like, this is my apartment, but by taking photos in such a homey space, it kind of implies to the audience that that is your apartment because we don't automatically assume, oh, this is probably a studio space that they rented. Now, I am not an Instagrammer, I'm not a photographer, so I can't speak to this, but I can see how this would be helpful to an Instagrammer who doesn't have the most Instagrammable apartment, whatever that means, but you're working with brands and maybe the brands expect a certain aesthetic from you. So if that's the only way that you can achieve that and do your job and get your coin, do your thing. But again, I hope that you're honest and open about it just for the sake of transparency. But also it's so weird to me that we have this ideal of what a home should be or what it should look like based on what looks good on camera. Kind of related, people also rent or Airbnb mansions in order to create content in them. I think Tana Mojo did this once. She did like a house tour, but it like wasn't her house. Classic Tana. Also, Lil Tay, the poor child who was forced to be this character because she was directed by her older brother. She turned into this character of like the youngest flexor and she would like make fun of people for not being as rich as her basically. Social media is dystopian. Anyway, she flexed a mansion pretending that it was hers and she was always in luxury cars with like wads of cash. And it turns out that the house that she had pretended was hers was actually just an open house and her mom was a real estate agent and she just had access to that property and the cars were her mom's boss's cars and he had not given them permission to like film in his vehicles. So her mom ended up losing her job over that and Lil Tay's illusion of being a young flexor was ruined. But also I hold the adults accountable in her life because they shouldn't have forced her to do that. Another lovely thing, you can pay to rent time in a grounded private jet just to take pictures in them. Yeah, there's at least one company, but probably more that do this. Come on in, do your Instagram photo shoot, pretend that you're jet setting across the world in a private plane when you're literally just sitting in one. Taking photos, the illusion. And the last part of the dark side of flex culture is people can say that they bought things, but that is not always necessarily true. Again, regarding the pressure that many influencers feel to film really extravagant, expensive haul videos, apparently many YouTubers now will buy a lot of items for a video or for a haul and then just go return them. Back in my day, haul videos were meant to be a video where you show off what you bought. And now it's like, you're not making a haul video because you bought things, you're buying things to make a haul video and then you're returning them. It's like, what is happening? I understand if something doesn't fit right or you bought it online, but like people are intentionally doing this just for the content, just so they can put it in their thumbnail that they spent a lot of money. Illusion. When you think, how do these YouTubers buy so much clothing? Maybe they're not buying any clothing at all. It's possible. Last but not least, let's discuss how flex culture has encouraged the growth of the counterfeit market. Fakes, dupes, knockoffs, counterfeit. We see this in clothing, we see this in bags, makeup even. Some people buy fakes, of course, to try to get away with it, to try to create the image, the illusion that they are in fact wearing designer or luxury items when they are not. Lots of counterfeits are actually quite believable, so especially on a platform like Instagram, it is more possible to get away with that and have people not notice that what you're wearing is not legit. So you can buy really cheap things that look really expensive and give off that illusion of wealth. Lately on YouTube, I've seen a rise of creators specifically seeking out fake items, counterfeit items, and making videos about them for the fun of it. Like Sophia Nygaard did one going to these markets and she was buying counterfeit items, fakes, that were very obviously fake to where it was kind of funny. But then there have been a lot of videos of people like testing out fakes and comparing those to the real versions and I just feel like that encourages people to buy them. Some people though just don't have a problem with knockoffs. Like my little brother even, he replied to me on Instagram saying that he bought fake AirPods why would you do that? He says, for the clout. And I was like, wow, you are the example for this video. So they were like $10, they didn't even work, so it was a waste of money. I was like, hmm, was that worth it for you? So what, you could walk around and people would think that you had AirPods? And he's like, yeah. It's like, all right. At least for clothing, you can like actually wear it. It's not like it falls apart the first time you put it on, but like 
knockoff tech. Why would you buy cheap earbuds? They're not gonna work. Anyway, again, I'm not interested in designers really in the first place, and I wouldn't want to risk like being exposed or called out if somebody happened to notice that I was wearing a fake item but trying to pass it off as real. However, I must admit, I just remembered that in like middle school and high school, I used to buy the Payless versions of like Converse and Vans, because obviously I like the style of those shoes, and at that time I couldn't afford the real ones, so whatever. My point is I'm probably a hypocrite. Anyway, aside from the obvious problems of stealing designs, counterfeit goods can actually also be dangerous, especially in the case of counterfeit makeup. Again, thanks to social media, we've had a lot of cosmetic products very hyped up online. So like Kylie Cosmetics or Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson's launch, all of these big launches get hyped up, things sell out. So some people will look for these products on sites like eBay or Craigslist or even at markets. Some of them buy them assuming that they're the real thing, and some people buy them knowing that it's fake, but still wanting to buy it, because I guess it might be close enough. But did you guys watch the Broken series on Netflix? They had one episode that focused on counterfeit makeup and specifically how YouTuber influencer culture influences this and is involved, and it was very interesting. In case you don't watch it though, just know counterfeit makeup can be dangerous. It is not good for your skin. A lot of this makeup is contaminated and contains ingredients and and things that you do not want to put on your face or in your body in any way. For hyped up releases, make sure you only buy products from trusted stores. Do not risk buying it online on some website like eBay or in Santee Alley in LA. By the way, again, Smoky Glow, Hannah, also made a video about that if you wanna watch that. And now we have reached the end of the video and this is where I get really like sentimental and soft. Overall, we just need to find worth and value in other things, in ourselves and in other people, okay? It's not ideal for people to value you based on what you have or how much money you make. It's empty. I know that social media makes this life, the influencer lifestyle, seem really glamorous and exciting and luxurious, and I'm sure it can be, but also many influencers have admitted to feeling empty and sad, even with mansions overflowing with luxury goods, because cliche, that is not what's gonna make you happy. I encourage people to be more honest on social media. Try your hardest not to give into these pressures. I also think it's really important to just make real connections with people and also to have hobbies that are not about making money, they're just about enjoyment. These are the things that are actually gonna bring your life some joy, hopefully. Anyway, thank you for watching. Make sure you guys check out my vlog channel. I've been posting there more frequently. I also have a podcast called Previously Gifted. You can watch on YouTube or listen on podcast apps or Spotify. You can follow me on Instagram for some mediocre pics. You can follow me on Twitter for some political tweets. And please subscribe if you enjoyed this and stay tuned for my next internet analysis video. Okay, thanks, bye.